Hello, welcome back to another episode of Pharisee Follower. This channel is uh, a way for me to um, follow Jesus and follow his words. And um, the name of this channel comes from a passage in Matthew 23 where he says, Jesus says, the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, so be careful to obey everything they tell you to. So this is a way, this channel is a way of following Jesus, even even his hard sayings, trying to understand his hard sayings. Um, something I've been chewing on the past few days and weeks and wanted to just talk about here was um, the mention of Pharisees in the Gospels. I did a word search um, on blueletterbible.com and came up with 82, I think, 81 or 82 mentions of the word Pharisees in the Gospels. And um, what's interesting is pre predominantly um, these are negative uh, references to the Pharisees. So um, anything from Jesus arguing with them about uh, ritual hand washing and like in Matthew 15, Mark 7, to the Pharisees plotting to kill him. Um, and so what's interesting though is not all of the references are these kind of negative arguments versus Jesus. Um, in fact, there's a handful of uh, examples of the Pharisees being on the same side as Jesus. And I, I mentioned that in my last um, video. And I won't go into those passages here, but um, I will, I do want to start off with a few passages that kind of show that there's a division amongst the Pharisees within the Gospels. And then I want to talk about what that division may mean and what it may point to. Um, and some other sources for that outside of the Gospels. Um, and then maybe, and then hopefully I'll follow up with, a, or I'll end with a kind of a conclusion and, and what this means for us followers of Jesus today. So here on my screen I have, um, this is Matthew 5, verse 20. So this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is telling his disciples um, about that he came not to um, abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. And he goes on in chapter 5, verse 19, he says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So here we see Jesus, um, in, a, in a sense, elevating the Pharisees and, and being like a, a, a guide for his disciples. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and maybe another allusion, like I've been saying all along, maybe another allusion to Jesus' um, connection to the Pharisee. Uh, sect within Judaism of his time in the first century of the common era um, maybe even Jesus being a Pharisee himself um, there's there's a lot of information out there um, pointing to that being possible there's also a very good arguments of him being of another sect um, and, and that's not really you know I don't want to be dogmatic about it but I think the, the point I'm trying to make here is Again, there, there seems to be, you know, with these 81 references, 82 references of the word Pharisees in the gospel, um, there's some that point to maybe Jesus being in line with them. And, and what does that mean? So he's pointing to his disciples. He's saying, hey, um, have your righteousness surpassed that of the Pharisees? Why would Jesus say that if he goes on to give them, pronounce woes on them later in Matthew and in Luke. All right, now we're just going to go over to the Gospel of John. Now I'm using the HCSB version here. It's not necessarily my favorite. Um, 
I think each one can kind of have a benefit. It's just the one I have downloaded on my phone, so I'm using it. Um, okay, John 7, 46. Let's go there real quick. So this is... Um, real quick context is, um, well, let's read it. When some from the crowd, heard, this is starting in verse 40. When some from the crowd heard these words, they said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Doesn't the scriptures say that the Messiah comes from David's offspring from the town of Bethlehem? where David once lived. So a division occurred among the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. So there's, amongst the crowds, there's division. Uh, verse 45 says, Then the temple police came to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why haven't you brought him? The police answered, No man ever spoke like this. Then the Pharisees responded to them, Are you fooled too? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd, which doesn't know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus previously, being one of them, being a Pharisee himself, said to the other Pharisees, Our law, our law doesn't judge a man before it hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? They say, You're, you're not from Galilee too, are you? They replied, investigate and you will see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Okay, again, my point here is that there is a division amongst the Pharisees. Nicodemus on one hand and the rest of these Pharisees on the other. Now, let's go to John chapter 9. This is the story of the blind man being healed. And then Jesus says, go... Um, Go wash and um, show yourself to the priests. Um, and let's see. So starting in verse 13, they brought the man who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. So again, the Pharisees asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed and I can see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from Galilee or from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. There was a division among the Pharisees. Okay, the Gospels clearly show that there's a division amongst the Pharisees in Jesus' time. What might this division be? Well, we know from history, um, from historical sources such as Josephus, um, and then we also know from the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Oral Torah, which, yes, was codified after Jesus, but in Judaism is a, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, the belief that this Torah was given to Moses at Mount Sinai and it was two Torahs. It was an oral and a written Torah. And the oral was passed down orally and the written was passed down written. And so that was what the Mishnah was. It was a codifying of this oral Torah. So we can essentially see back into time when we read this document the Mishnah and the documentary commentary on it in the, the Gemara the Talmud um, is a living kind of documentation of what Judaism um, believed um, throughout time so um, in 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 the Mishnah um, oh sorry so so Josephus and the Talmud are two areas that we understand that there actually was a division amongst um, the Pharisees. Now, real quick, the Pharisees are the sect of Judaism that prevailed after the destruction of the temple. 
Um, I, I'm getting this from Jacob Neusner. Uh He has several books. One of them I'm reading right now is called, um, shoot, I don't have it next to me. Jacob Neusner has, has written hundreds of books uh, about this period. Um, but, but essentially the Pharisaic Judaism is what prevailed after the destruction of the temple in, in the year 70 of the Common Era. And that's what eventually led to the writing of the Mishnah and re basically rabbinic Judaism um, into Orthodox Judaism today. Now, that being said, in the Talmud, there are quite a bit of um, arguments between two houses of Pharisees. And what years were those houses? Right now, where Jesus is, in the in the, about the you know from four B.C. to thirty uh, A.D. or B or C.E. whatever you want to call it, uh, there were two houses, and those houses were the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel. Shammai was the an elder, uh, a Pharisee, and he discipled many Pharisees. At the same time that Hillel was also discipling and leading a bunch of Pharisees. Hillel came, f if I'm not mistaken, Hillel came first. Um, and then Shammai after him. And their prospective houses, they call them Beit in Hebrew, Beit is house, uh, would often argue. Now they are both Pharisees, but within Pharisee Judaism, there they they had differences. They disagreed. Now what's interesting is I kind of had been chewing on this this thought that is there a division amongst the Pharisees in the time of Jesus? And I heard that there is the house of Hillel versus the house of Shammai. But I actually found a really good article recently, and I wanted to just share it with you guys. So this is. Um, British Israel dot us I don't know this guy here I'll show you kind of the this this is not much on this and I could I could find out more but like this is just a huge article by this person at British dash Israel dot us so I wish I had more to to reference but I will link to this in the show notes and I'm gonna put on reader view so it's a little easier so this this uh, person argues for Jesus being a Hillelite Pharisee. And I'm going to read a little bit from his, his or her article. It says, was Jesus anti-Jewish? No. Jesus was a Hillel Pharisee in the midst of Shammai Pharisees. The law was forgotten in Israel until Hillel the Babylonian, and then those are the years, 60 BC to 20 AD, so right around when Jesus was born, came up and reestablished it. Jesus could have heard him in person because Jesus was 4 BC to 31 AD, roughly. Judaism was split into two camps, and he quotes Sanhedrin 88b. That's from the Talmud. Now, I will say I haven't gone into the Talmud and, and checked, but this is kind of lining up with some of the things I've heard. So it's it's very fascinating. I want to do some fact-checking here. Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. The Shammai Pharisees were in the majority in the Jewish Sanhedrin from about 20 BC until 70. Um, and they sat in the seat of Moses, Matthew 23, 2. So the people followed their oral law, but none of the Shamites believed in Jesus. Jesus condemned the Shamite Pharisees who made the commandment of God of none effect by your oral tradition. And Paul had no small disputa disputation with these Shamites, who said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Converted. Acts 15.1. Okay, I could go on. This article essentially argues that um, each of these statements against the Pharisees in the Gospels can be directed, uh, the negative ones can be directed at the house of Shammai. So, here is an example. Uh, let's do... Uh, 
This is a long article, just really, really rich. Um, okay, let's see. Let's do the Sabbath one. Um, and the Sabbath one's kind of long, but... Um, Okay, which Pharisees forbid prayer for the sick on the Sabbath? Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath through prayer, Matthew 12. This incident stems from a debate between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel over whether it is permitted to pray for the sick on the Sabbath, quoting that um, oral Torah. Beit Hillel permitted such prayer. Beit Shammai forbade it. In Mark 2.27, Jesus says, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In addition to prayer for the sick, Jesus' remark implies other disputes between the two schools, saying it is forbidden on the Sabbath to promise charity for the poor in the synagogue, even for marriage of orphans. Um, so basically, that's what Shammai is. She, he's forbidding all this stuff on the Sabbath while at and I go down here while Beit Hillel permitted all of these things. Um, and then it also goes on to talk about, like, what kind of work can you do on the Sabbath? Anyway, what's fascinating, each of these topics, so there's a lot of topics that Jesus argues with the, the Pharisees within the Gospels. Um, for example, there's eating with tax collectors, Matthew 9, Mark 2, Luke 5. Fasting, Matthew 9, Mark 2, Luke 5. Casting out de demons, Matthew 9 and Matthew 12. The Sabbath, Matthew 12, Mark 2, Luke 6. Uh, wanting signs, Matthew 12, 16 and Mark 8. Hand washing, Matthew 5 and Mark 7. Divorce, Matthew 9, Mark 10. Blasphemy, Luke 5. And adultery, John 8. So each of these, I'm wondering, and I'm kind of hypothesizing that when Jesus is arguing, with the Pharisees, he's actually arguing against this a specific group within the Pharisees, and that group being the house of Shammai. What's interesting is, um, and I don't know if it's this article or another one I read, but the fact that Hillel was around, alive when Jesus was born, all the way up till when Jesus was about 20, 25 years old, it begs the question, when Jesus in Ma in Matthew, I think, the story of when Jesus is left behind in Jerusalem while his parents leave to go back to home, and they find him talking and discussing and debating with the elders in the synagogue or the temple. Could that have been Hillel himself? <laughs> That's just fascinating to me, that like Jesus could have been a contemporary with Hillel, and then you you read his arguments of these Jewish laws like Sabbath and prayer and fasting. And each time, almost every time, Jesus is siding with Hillel. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I want to pull up another article, and this will kind of be my conclusion, and then I'll kind of share some other thoughts. Okay, this was a really good article. Uh, this is a blog by Thinking Faith back in 2016, and it's titled, Jesus was a Pharisee. Seriously, he was. Uh, and this guy, I forget his name, it'll be at the bottom, and I'll link it in the show notes, but this guy argues again for Jesus being a Pharisee, and I just loved his conclusion, so I want to read his conclusion, and then, um, and then I want to just talk about my own perspective. So he says, whether or not one believes that Jesus was a Pharisee, how we view the Pharisees is very important for modern Christians. Apart from the basic idea that historical accuracy matters, a reassessment of our attitude towards the Pharisees is critical for two reasons. First, when we can see more clearly the Jewish context of Jesus' life and ministry, we can better understand his teachings. Amen. We can see him as a rabbi advocating for his people against an occupying empire, rather than as a religious iconoclast rebelling against religious traditionalists. His religious and political views both come into sharper focus when we can see him in his Jewish context. Uh, this is Bill Trench. You can see that at the bottom. The second point is also of great practical importance. Many Christians do not understand that modern Judaism 
across the spectrum from the Orthodox to Reform and even Reconstructionist all have their roots in the Pharisaic movement. When Christians slander the Pharisees of Jesus' time, they are also implicitly criticizing modern Judaism. This is oddly ironic, since both Christianity and modern Judaism share a common beginning in the Pharisaic movement. Although the irony may be amusing, the practical result is that the historic Christian slander of the Pharisees has contributed to anti-Semitism. A more accurate historical appreciation of the Pharisees can give us a clearer understanding of Jesus' life and ministry and open the way to a more helpful relationship between Christianity and Judaism. And that's really my passion right there, is there, there is more to this story than just this, the American Christian Sunday school answer of Jesus loves you. There's more to this story, this good news, than just Jesus died on the cross and he rose again. There's a whole history here. And I, I don't say that to make light of Jesus' death and Jesus' love. I do believe he died. I do believe he rose again. And I do believe that is paramount to Christians and our faith. But when I can understand his context, when I can see that he's not fighting against all Pharisees, but he's fighting against some evil Shamite Pharisees and siding with Hillel's more gracious attitude. Um, I see Jesus within his own people, within Judaism. And if that's true, then what does that mean for followers of Jesus today that aren't Jews like me? One, I think this Mr. Trench, Bill Trench, has a great conclusion. Like, we can help restore this relationship between Christianity and Judaism. And I'll even throw in Islam in there. These three monotheistic faiths that really came from Judaism, Christianity and Islam coming from Judaism. We, there, there's something monumental here that can happen if we can see Jesus within Judaism. So, I just wanted to share that uh, with you all today, and um, I'll link these wonderful articles in the show notes, and um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them them on the video. All right, shalom.